Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Welcome to day two of the ICF India Conclave, a conclave that has coaching and growth as its essence. My gratitude to each of you who participated with enthusiasm yesterday and made day one what it was, a rocking day one. We begin day two with a topic that touches the core of both coaching and growth. Yes, and it's fabulous in finite possibilities. In today's fast changing post pandemic world, leaders need to embody a growth mindset and embrace a future focus more than ever. They need to look forward and beyond. Coaching is truly a powerful way to support this but don't take my word for it. In this context, it becomes equally important for coaches to think strategically and support their clients to do the same. I invite you now, ladies and gentlemen, to join our two amazing speakers, both of them based at a completely different time zone from India. I think it's 8.30 PM there for that both masterful and seasoned coaches as they lead this power talk with a little bit of dialogue thrown in as well. It's my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker to you, David B. Peterson, PhD and Chief Transformation Officer at Seven Paths Forward LLC. David has been recognized as a world-class executive coach and thought leader in leadership and executive development for over 25 years. From 2011 to 2020, he was head of Google's executive and coaching and leadership team, where he built one of the you know, world's most innovative and high impact coaching programs and personally coached hundreds of Google's top leaders. In 2019, he was selected as the number one corporate coach in the world by Marshall Goldsmith MG100 and in 2020 received a Lifetime Achievement Award from Coaching at Work. The first time I listened to David's session, I was amazed by his masterful ability to simplify difficult concepts and I am truly looking forward to that in today's session as well. Welcome, David. Welcome to India. Welcome to Chennai. And over to you. Thank you so much. I am genuinely pleased to be here. I am looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. And I'm really looking forward to um, being partnered with Damien here today. We, we are good friends going way, way back in time. So it's a pleasure to be co-presenting with him. As you can see, my title is Seeing Around Corners, Preparing for a Disruptive Future. So the future focus is here, but this is just a brief introduction and it's going to be a whirlwind tour. So I invite you to come along and we are just going to skate the surface of a number of different important issues here. So I have a thought question for you to begin. When successful leaders fail, what is the number one reason? So think about that. Think about a successful reader, leader that you know who failed or derailed, who went off the rails. Why? What is that? And my answer, and there are many possible answers here, but my answer is because they don't adapt when things change. So something changes around them. They think, I'm good. I have the answer and they don't adapt. They don't see the signals. They don't have foresight into what's going to happen. They don't see around the corner. They just see what's right in front of them. Something changes and they continue down the same path and they go off the edge. So what's critically important here is recognizing that the future is changing faster than we think. This is a recent book from a year ago called The Future is Faster Than You Think. And it's a little bit of a play on words. So, so the future is faster than you think it will be, but it's also faster than you think. 
So we can't even think as fast as the future is coming toward us. And please, you know, jot down any questions or thoughts you have. So when we do get to the Q&A, we can come back and pick up on any of these particular thoughts. So the challenge for us as leaders and as coaches is how can we learn and adapt faster than the pace of change? And because the pace of change is accelerating, it's harder and harder for us to keep pace. So what's interesting is that the faster things change, the more important it is to see what's going on objectively. There are many subtle signals. There's lots of information that's vague and weak. How do we make sense of that? And how do we recognize which of our old assumptions, our old beliefs, our unquestioned habits, our mindless behaviors, just going through things in the same habits that we always do, they actually become more dangerous because the road is curving and we just think, oh, I've always driven straight down this road. And that's where people get in trouble. So part of what I wanna talk about is this notion of seeing around corners. It's just one element of foresight. But what's interesting to me is if you're walking down a street and you wanna see around corners, it's really hard. So you have to just walk up there and get and then you look around. But one way that you can begin to see around corners is by lifting up. So imagine that you're in a helicopter going above the city and then you look down and you can see around all the corners. So a different point of view, a different perspective enables you to see around corners. Another way you can see around corners is through friends and teams and networks. You can say, hey, Damien, you're farther down that other street than I am. What do you see? And I can call on all my friends and together we can paint a collective picture of what the city looks like. We can all see around corners by each of us being in different locations and sharing that information. So there's a number of other ways that we can see around corners too, but it really requires a shift in perspective. And to back up a bit, if you want to see around corners, you must first be able to see. And when I say see, I'm really talking about perceiving in any number of ways. So we can you know, sense things, we can feel things, we can think things, but that ability to see and to perceive what is coming is essential. Foresight, I break down into three components. First of all, it's seeing, it's seeing ahead, it's seeing what's coming, it's seeing uh, around corners. And importantly, when things are changing, it's seeing around corners before other people do. It's that ability that creates competitive advantage for you. And it helps you adjust to rapid changes that may actually disrupt others. When you see what's going on, you then have to make better decisions. And you have less information because it hasn't delivered yet. It hasn't arrived yet. So you have to be able to see and then make better decisions about what's coming with less information and then take action. What will you do differently? One of my favorite quotes says that all of your knowledge is about the past and all of your decisions are about the future. And if the future is changing, that means that all your knowledge about the past is suspect. It may not be useful. We just don't know which pieces of this are useful and not. So we have to see what's happening. We have to make sense of it so we can make better decisions and then take better action. One of the challenges is that we are not wired to see changes the way they're happening today. Change is happening exponentially. We're used to linear change. So if I were to get up from this desk in my office here at home and walk 30 steps, you would have a really good idea of how far I traveled. I might be in the kitchen. I might be able to get out the front door, but I'd still be really close to my office. But exponential steps, imagine that every step I take is twice as far as the step before it. So I go one step and that's, let's just say one foot. And then the next is I travel two feet, and then I travel four feet, and then eight feet, and then 16 feet, 
So exponentially, it doubles every step. What do you, how far do you think I would travel exponentially in 30 steps? Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, et cetera. It always boggles my mind when I think about this. It would take me 28 times around the world, just 30 steps. It would take me to the moon and back. And that's why you see in this little cartoon this, oh, I think I know where I'm going. I'm walking down this road and then zoom. I didn't expect that. I didn't see that coming. This is what's happening to us. So foresight, that ability to see what's coming in an exponential world becomes super critical. And the key to this, and this is called the big question number one, what are you paying attention to? Are you looking for new information? Are you paying attention to the subtle trends and the new information that you're getting? And the part that's challenging about this is attention is a limited resource. So we, we can only invest so much. So I encourage you to be very intentional about what you pay attention to, very thoughtful about that. And the same thing for your coaching clients. What are they paying attention to? Are they really paying attention to what matters the most? And so clarifying what really matters and where am I going to invest my attention becomes one of the most fundamental questions that we can help our clients with today. And there are four areas, and this is where we could spend a week diving into all of this. So I'm just going to give it to you in one minute. But I look at four different directions for looking and seeing and paying attention. One is to look deeper inside yourself, looking inward. What matters to me? Who do I want to be? What is important to me? And again, these are questions that you can ask your clients as well. What's most important? Who do you want to be? Who are you becoming? Second, can we look farther across time, looking farther into the future? And the parallel for this is the ability to look back because so many patterns that we can make sense of are from the past. What's the rhythm of life? And then can you use that information to project into the future? And so the farther you can look back, the more patterns you can see, the farther you can look forward. Third, can you see bigger systems? Are you looking at your family, your community, your organization, your industry, your economy, the world? And so at each stage, you have to step back a little bit and see the bigger system. And if people, if you're coaching someone or you're just thinking yourself about, oh, it's me and my little company here, you're not going to be as aware of the patterns as you would be if you're looking at industry trends and macroeconomic trends. And then finally, can you see things from diverse perspectives? Can you put yourself into other people's shoes? Can you look through other lenses to appreciate diversity and create a sense of inclusion and belonging? We're mostly going to look at just one or two of those elements today. And here's one tool to do that. It's just four directions for reflection. And one of them is looking inward, what matters to you, looking outward, looking backward, looking forward. And as you look at things from these different perspectives, you start to make sense of things at a higher level. So there are a number of questions here that will provoke some thinking and reflection. And there's also this notion of what's the frame that you're looking through. So you see this frame, it's, it kind of focuses on a narrow part of this. But if you step back, you see the bigger picture. There's this notion, this tool, another tool, I call the reflection calendar, which focuses on just today, what matters to me today. But you can step back and say, well, what matters next week? And what matters next month? What matters next quarter? And the more you start to think about these things on different time frames, and you think about where was I a year ago? Where do I want to be a year from now? You become more intentional about your behaviors. You become more self-aware. You start to see bigger patterns. And so you can even step back and think about the next five years or the next three years or the next 10 years. That's what quinquennially and decadally mean, every five to 10 years. And then there's this other notion of just periodically, 
once in a while step back and say, what's going on here? Oh, I'm before I jump ahead, the, you see in the bottom right hand, there's a link to the reflection calendar, a list of other questions and frameworks that you can use here for reflection for yourself and for your clients. So feel free to go and download a copy of the reflection calendar. Second big, big question. You're paying attention to new things. What are you optimizing for? Are you optimizing for today? Or are you optimizing for five years or 10 years? Are you optimizing for your life? Are you optimizing for you or your organization or your community or the world? These are big, big questions. We don't have time to dive into them right now, but I encourage you to start thinking more flexibly about what matters today, what matters in five years, what matters in my life. And here, just one simple point to, to grab your attention here. If the world were stable, all you would have to do is say, I'm going to get good at what I'm doing right now. Companies have done this. And then when things changed, if we go back to the very first question, why do successful leaders fail? Why do successful organizations fail? They don't adapt when things change. And because our world is changing faster than ever, we need to start thinking about how do I optimize for tomorrow? How do I make sure that I can see around corners? How do I make sure that I'm experimenting and trying new things so I'm getting new ideas and new insights into what's going on so I can make better choices and better decisions and have better behaviors and better actions to accomplish what matters to me? So experimenting and trying new things and learning new skills and seeing from different points of view becomes ever more important as we as our world continues to change around us. Another tool, and this is just one of the many tools that we can use for foresight, is something called first and second and third order consequences. So I'll just ask you a really simple question about exercise. What are the first order consequences of exercise? So you wake up one day and you say, okay, I'm going to start exercising. You, you begin, what's the first thing that happens? So I immediately think about, well, I'm gonna go for a run. Okay, well, I have to go find some shoes, I have to find some gear, I have to think about the weather. Then I go start running, I get sweaty, I get tired. The next day my muscles are sore. So the first order consequences of exercise are almost all bad. If you made a decision about exercise based on the first order consequences, you would never do it. But when you think about the second order consequences, you keep running, you keep exercising, what happens? Second order consequences, you get fitter, you probably lose weight, you have more energy, you might become more attractive to people. And if you make your decisions based on your choices based on first order decisions, they're almost always different consequences than the second order consequences. And in fact, first level thinking is really easy and obvious. And people all tend to agree. What's going to happen when you exercise? Well, you're going to get sweaty and tired. Very few people would argue with that. But then the second order consequences, you have to really think through okay, well, how much do I have to run to get fit? And what if the weather is bad? And there are so many other variables. And then you start thinking about the third order consequences. If I'm out there running for years, I'm going to start to have joint damage. I'm, you know, if I, if I break a, a, a limb or something or a trip, then I can't exercise. So when you think about the third order consequences, I start thinking, well, maybe walking and yoga are better options for me. And in fact, walking and yoga are the options I have chosen as my exercise routine, partly because of thinking about, can I sustain this over time? Will it enable me to you know, do other things and to thrive in this world? But it takes more time, it's not as obvious, and it doesn't give you immediate rewards. So seeing around corners, Asking yourself, number one, what am I optimizing for? Is there a significant or important value that I should be 
pro prioritizing more highly in my, my list of what matters to me? And will this actually make my life easier in the long run or harder in the long run? One of the earlier examples was a yummy dessert. Yummy dessert is yummy. So immediate gratification, but over time, it actually makes my life less pleasant, less comfortable, and may impact me in really negative ways, heart attacks, weight gain. And then a second question to think about, if the first order consequences are positive, what will I regret later if I don't do this? If the first order consequences are negative, I, I'm sorry, I, I just confused those two. If the first order consequences are positive, what will I regret later? And if they're negative, what will I, I'm sorry, what will I regret if I don't do this? I hope you followed that. I was kind of muddled it, but yeah. It's almost always the opposite direction of the first order consequence. So one of the most powerful lessons I learned in my life, and this came from starting to think about second order consequences. This quote, a year from now, you may wish you had started today. When I, back when I knew, when I first met Damien, I'm just thinking back to our days at this earlier company, I was always telling myself, in three months, when I have more time, I'm really going to work on my personal development. In three months, when I have more time, I'm going to definitely start writing this book. And about five years later, I remember waking up, just like she's saying here, one day going like, why didn't I start five years ago? My life has never gotten easier. I never have more time a month or two or three than I do now. So start now. That is the main way that you actually begin to make progress on the important things. You will never have enough time. So start now. And we will make this available. I'll close with just a, uh, another a link here, my company name and my LinkedIn profile. Go to this sevenpassforward.com, download the reflection calendar, and you can connect with me there. Thank you so much. I look forward to the Q&A and I look forward to hearing from Damien. Thanks, David. Uh, what I said in the introduction about you know presenting, I would say some of the most difficult things with such simplicity and you know, I, I just felt that, hey, I can see around the corner right away. You know, it seemed that simple. Uh, but yes, I, I am going to come back to you with questions uh, once, you know, we hear from Damien as well. So welcome, Damien. I know most people, especially around our part of the world, know you so well. But, you know, you must give me two minutes to definitely introduce you to those who don't. So, um Folks, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Damian Goldberg. Damian has 30 years of experience in executive coaching and leadership development, working with individuals, organizations in over 60 countries. Wow. He is an MCC from ICF and received his PhD in organizational psychology from Alliant University in California. He's also the author of five books, a professional certified speaker, CSP, and an accredited, accredited coach supervisor, ESIA, and facilitates global virtual certifications on professional coaching, mentor coaching, and of course, coaching supervision, ESQA. He was the 2013-14 International Coaching Federation Global President and received the 2018 ICF Circle of Distinction Award and 2019 EMCC Supervision Award. Wow, Damien, that's like really, really goals for many of us coaches sitting here. Now, over to you and to listen to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here and in particular sharing this space with, with David. We used to work together for the same company many years ago, Personal Decisions International. I learned a lot from him at that time. He, at that point, was the chair of the coaching um, department. So he came up with training for a lot of the staff on coaching skills. I went through your coacherama, David, I don't know, 20 years ago, and also trained 
leaders all over the world with a coaching program that he developed uh, that came up with a book, Leader as a Coach. So many years later, it's great to be here together sharing this space. And I love your presentation. I think it was a great presentation. And I would like to, to compliment some of what you share from the perspective of a coach working globally and as a leader, of an ICF leader, also having the opportunity to meet coaches worldwide. So when we worked together with David many years ago for this company called Personal Decisions International, I had the opportunity to travel worldwide. And I had the opportunity to provide coaching, training, and assessment centers. And in the assessment centers, we will work with leaders, and we will do simulations and determine what were the strengths, what they could leverage, and what were weaknesses, where were areas for opportunity. And interestingly, the two areas that came up the most as areas for development were leaders working worldwide in Fortune 100 companies, top of line. The two areas that most common people need to work on were strategic thinking and building their team coaching skills. So coaching skills and uh, strategic thinking that is about what David was talking about, foresight. Thinking about the future, preparing for the future, and spending time and giving importance to that thinking. So when I share with you PowerPoint briefly, and in this, uh, in this PowerPoint, let me open it here. I think you should be able to see it here. Um, it's good. Okay, great. So, so basically, I was sharing with you that I had the opportunity to work in all of these countries. I also had the opportunity to work in the global board of directors of ICF for six years. And I see here one of the participants is Meryl Moritz, who sit with me in the global board for five years. So she's a witness of some of the things that I'm going to share with you today. And I do believe that we, as coaches, we, be, we have a responsibility to be change agents. So as David was talking about the importance for leaders to adapt to the changes, I believe that we as coaches have a responsibility to work with leaders so they can develop awareness about how they can be prepared to embrace these changes and develop skills to embrace the future now looking at these corners that David was talking about. So because of that, I was very interested in studying the future. And I felt that my responsibility as a leader and as an executive coach was to develop skills so I could be effective in bringing this awareness to my clients and bringing this awareness to my communities. So I went and I, even though I was already a PhD, my PhD is in organizational psychology for 20 years ago, I went and I got trained on foresight. So I wanted to be strong on being able to bring this to my work and bring this to my clients. So David was talking before about the importance of foresight for leaders and for coaches. So there are many places, and I know that part is part of the work that David is doing now in part of training coaches on some of his skills. But thinking about the future became one of my concerns in the last few years, and I went through the Institute for the Future. And by the way, this is a good resource if you're interested in learning more about working in the future, the Institute for the Future has a lot of resources, mainly it's a non-for-profit. So there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of materials, studies, research uh, projects, all available. And so this is a really good place to, to learn more about. And the other place where I went is the University of, Hat of Hudson in Houston, in uh, the, in the University of Houston in the technology department. They have also a program of foresight. So they were the two places where I went and I got two trainings and I want to share with you some of the learning from that. But also the Singularity University now is another great place to look and pay attention to all of the work that they are doing. So these are places that if you're interested in the future and as a coach, as a leader, I think that you should be. These are places for you to pay attention to and learn from. And if we look at coaching and we look at the future of coaching, what are the things that as coaches we need to be paying attention to? And our relationship with the future is one of them. 
are we studying foresight? Are we paying attention to what's happening on the corners like David is talking? One of the places to find that is in the newspapers. Are we paying attention in the newspapers? What are these future trends? What are the things that we need to pay attention to? And what do you think is our job as social change agents in shaping the future of the world? I do believe that we as coaches have a big place in doing this work one by one with every leader that we work, with every team in every organization that we work. I do believe that we do have a responsibility and it's so great that in this Indian conclave, you put this in the forefront of the discussion, coaching for growth, thinking about the future. Um, the name of this session is a growth mindset and future fo focus on coaching. And I'm so glad that uh, we have this space with David to, to talk about this. Now, one of the areas, and when I talk about Mary Moritz sitting together at the Global Board of Directors, we were thinking about the future and what were the areas where we as leaders in the coaching profession needed to pay attention to. And what came up was the importance of supervision. Now, supervision, not as controlling on telling people what to do, but from the perspective of looking at the distance and reflecting on our work. So David talked about the importance of reflection. He talked about inside reflection, further reflection, all of these four different levels of reflection. When there is one that is very important, that is our inner reflection, thinking about ourselves, looking about ourselves, looking about our practice, reflecting on our practice. And as coaches, we all have opportunities to keep growing and learning. I have been a master certified coach for more than 10 years. And I keep working, I have my supervisors, I keep learning, taking classes, because I do believe that we as coaches need to be committed to continue learning. And this is the new ICF core competency. For people who are familiar with the International Coach Federation core competency model, the new competency that came up last year is the coaching mindset. And the coaching mindset is about the way that coaches what the way of that the way that coaches are being not only what we are doing but who we are being as coaches to the extent that we are investing in our own training and development and we know that from all of the participants here a big number are coaches so i want to recognize you and congratulate you for being here because being in this conclave is one of the ways that you are showing your commitment to your own personal growth learning and development and the coaching mindset is about that it's about keep learning, growing, and also reflecting on our job. And this is what is supervision. Supervision is not well known yet in many parts of the world. It's very well known in the UK, where this has been presented for more than 10 years. The European Mentor and Coaching Council uh, considered supervision as a uh, very important for coaches and is mandatory as part of ethical uh, responsibility. ICF does not consider it mandatory, but still as a way to keep learning and growing and developing and getting CCEUs. So there is a space for um, supervision at ICF. There is a new community of practice now for ICF on coaching supervision. I have been one of the advocates of coaching supervision in the Americas. We started a network of coaching supervisors in the Americas and one in Asia too. So that's something that many of you may be interested in participating and getting involved in the Asian Supervisors Network, a space for coaches and supervisors to keep learning. And uh, I want to bring to everybody's attention the possibility, if you are not familiar with what is supervision, to learn more about it, to be sure that you have a space to reflect on your work and on your practice. The, when we're looking about the future, we want to pay attention to five elements, what's happening in this step acronym. So when we're working with our client, this is one of the places we can go. We can look at what is happening socially, what is happening technologically, what is happening economically, and what's happening in the environment and in the political arena. So these are five areas that you may want to be paying attention when you're doing the reflection, when you're working with leaders. How are the trends 
and how are we paying attention to these elements in terms of the present and the future? And what do we need to bridge the gap? And in terms of working and learning and the future, if the Institute for the Future has, as I shared with you, different research uh, projects and activities, these are some of the things that they are talking about for leaders and coaches to pay attention to. And to be successful in the future, we need to keep developing people skills. We need to develop resilience, particularly addressing what David talked before about adaptability and change. And these are some of the key and, and working virtually because as, and interestingly, all of this was before COVID. Now people had to work virtually. There is not any other way to do it, but people who came up with some of these trends were pre seeing, foreseeing that working virtually and collaborating virtually will be one of the trends and something that people need to be prepared for. So I want to wrap up inviting you to think about like this puzzle, all of these pieces, everything you're learning in this conference, everything that you are learning on all of the different activities that you participate. Um, we're talking about before learning about trends by reading the newspapers, paying attention to the news. And if you had to put a puzzle to start putting some order to make sense of what's going on in the world today. And we need to look at compass. We need to be sure that we pay our attention and we're focused so we can be more effective because sometimes it can be overwhelming so much going on in the world. And I do believe, as I was saying before, that as coaches in looking in the future, we want to pay attention to how we collaborate to ignite social change and how we can collaborate also as volunteers. I am sure that many of you participate in many volunteer projects. I have been a volunteer in many different activities over the years, and I keep doing that. And I do believe that as coaches, we all we can find a space to volunteer our time to grow the coaching profession and make a difference in the world. But we cannot do that alone. We need to do that with other people. So I want to invite you to consider who are possible partners for you to do this. And to finish, I want to invite you what, uh, to think about what Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin said, recognize your limits, but never respect them. And here is some of my information if you want to get in touch with me um, through LinkedIn, in YouTube. I have more than 250 videos available and also in LinkedIn and in my website. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Damien. Uh, another, I think, you know, I, I, I almost felt that uh, it, it just so beautifully complemented what David was saying, but we need different languages to send the same message. And I really liked the focus on the coach that you brought in because uh, at the end of David's session, I was thinking, okay, this is like great, you know, seeing around corners and foresight and everything. How do I do this as a coach? And I was, that was playing in my mind. So your presentation, I think, really sort of answered some of that. Though I must say, uh, this is always going to be work in progress. Uh, so, so if I may, there are a few questions that's come up, but there's one question in particular um, that you know I want to bring up here and, and maybe just have both of you talk about it uh, a, a little bit, which is from C N Murthy, um, and you know he says, given the chaotic times we live in. Uh, excelling in the ability to manage disruptive innovation is more important than ever. Sure. How does a coach help leaders develop this capability? Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think that sort of puts the pieces together, right? How do we? How does mm -hmm. coaching sort of help in serving what both of you spoke about? You want to go first, David? I'm happy to. So it was on one of the slides that I showed, uh, uh, at least similar. I often start asking people the simple question, and then what? So as, as we're talking about, well, I need to do this and I want to do this, and a, a, a normal coach is just going to walk through the process of, okay, and why do you want to do that and, and what happens? But continuing to ask the question, and then what? And then what happens? And then what happens? And then what happens? And I can almost take that to the point of being annoying with my clients, but it's a muscle that they have to get comfortable with. And they're often very short-term focused. I, 
I can't imagine that anybody in the audience here is short-term focused, but say you have a friend who is, and you start asking them, and then what happens? And what happens if you do that? They start to say, well, you know what? And they start to see into the future a little bit more. So that's the simple way to start to build this muscle, just that one simple question. The second is using the reflection calendar. Where do you want to be a year from now, five years from now, a quarter from now? You can pick the time frame that you want, but as you start to think about, well, if, if I want to be here in five years, I need to start doing something differently now. Mm -hmm. So what I, I really like your ideas, David, very much. I use a different question with the same goal here, and it's what else? So when somebody is talking and saying, what else? And the client would answer what they know. And then you ask again, and what else? And the second time they will answer something that they know. But the third one, they, they say, oh, I don't know anything else. And I say, okay, keep trying. Because when you keep pressing, then is when you are going to have new insights where you will go to the area that you don't know that you know, that is somewhere. So that is a really good technique. I like to ask what else a few times, knowing that at the beginning it's easy and then it becomes difficult, but I don't give up. I keep asking because by putting some stress and tension, we may be creative and innovative. Uh, so this is one of the ways. The other way is many times people define their lives for what they think is possible and what is not possible. So we live like in a box, okay? This is possible from here. So many times people don't see other possibilities and cannot be innovative because they are convinced that these are the limitations. So I think part of our job as coaching is to challenge people's beliefs about what is possible and what is not, uh, and challenge them to see what they are not paying attention to, and invite them to be innovative, even though they may think they are not. So for example, like I working with a client who wants to be more innovative and he, and by the way, if they want to be more innovative, that's a really great thing because most of the time people who are not innovative, they don't know it. So just being aware is the first step. So the first step is being aware and being willing because you can be aware, but not be willing. Why? Because you'll be maybe afraid to change. And then you realize because you are afraid of changing, you don't do anything. And then you get behind and you still are in trouble. Remember what David said, how he started his presentation about the importance of adaptability. So it's about going to uncomfortable places. And I think that the coach needs to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and invite the clients to do the same. And we, if we don't take risks, we cannot be innovative. So innovative means you need to think out of the box. It means taking risks. So sometimes the job of the coach is to help the coach, the client, to identify what is stopping them, what is in their way to be innovative, what is in their way to be creative, what is in their way to think big. So these are some of them ways to work on that. Yeah, I, I I distinctly remember a couple of years ago when I had a coach or I had a coaching conversation with somebody like David. Um, I was so uncomfortable, you know, the what next that that I, I was even thinking, what am I doing here? Why? Why is this person sort of pushing me? You know, and and I realized that person was taking a risk. Uh, but what worked was you know, to take me to that safe space to say, it's okay, I got your back, but I'm still going to push you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is great. And, and I think David also mentioned the ability before foresight is to simply see, right? And if you can't see, then where's the question of foresight? So that, that I think really sat well with what you said, Damien. Uh, there's another question that's coming to my mind, right? In whether it's foresight or the ability to see corners, um, does it connect more closely with potential, you know, which is very, very important in coaching, yeah, the ability to maximize potential? Or is it about the here and now and sort of performance? Uh, is it a triangle that's kind of emerging here and which part of the triangle does this attach to? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by the triangle, but the first part of the question I can speak to and then maybe it'll get clearer. Yeah. So, there's a theory about leadership and, and levels of leadership. So an entry-level worker is really focused on today. 
What do I need to get done today? How am I being measured on my performance today? If we go to the extreme opposite, a CEO needs to be thinking, how are we building this organization so we will thrive in five years or 10 years? So, so we won't be disrupted by something. And so at every level of an organization or as organizations get bigger, the time frame shifts. And so many people, like e even if you think about school, we are optimizing for the test. I'm optimizing for the grade in this class. I'm not thinking, you know, as a seven-year-old, how do I get to college and do all these other things? And the ones who can see farther into the future, who have longer time frames, they tend to be more mature. They're more resilient. They're, they're, they have more equanimity, one of my favorite words. They're less disrupted by, oh, you know, I, I, a bad thing happened to me yesterday. What am I going to do? Well, if, if you're looking at the next 10 years and you say, will that matter at all a year from now? It's like, no, okay, then just move on. And so the potential of people to have a longer time frame, to be more intentional about where you're going and what you're doing, you can build bigger things. You can have greater impact. And that ability to have greater impact in the future is essentially the definition of potential, potential to do something bigger and better in the future. So yes, it's very much related to that. Yeah, I, I think I got my answer. Thanks, David. <laughs> so I mean, if, if I may just throw, you know, another very simplistic question, right? So, so I'm doing all this, I'm looking into the future, I'm, I'm kind of gearing up, you know, for the bigger picture. Um, how do I then balance it with the battles that I'm fighting today? Um, you know, as as that as that entry line worker, or you know, as that as that kid of seven, right? Uh, seven year olds say that they're stressed out too. So they've got battles to fight as let, well. Let, let, let me just briefly say that this is a great question. And interestingly, when I went through this training that I shared with you, the certifications to become a foresight practitioner. Everybody in this class was talking about that, that their companies were not, the company, the culture of the organizations were not willing to invest money and time for them to spend time thinking about the future and enforce it. And then I thought, oh, this sounds familiar. This sounds very familiar. Because when I go to organizations, I heard that all the time about coaching. You know, what do I mean? <laughs> like many times, it, we as coaches have to work hard many times for organizations to understand the importance of investing money in development. Now, things are much better, David, than they were 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was much harder sell. Right now, I think that companies, organizations are much more open. And, and in this conference, there are many leaders, HR uh, 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 partners here today, so there is much more awareness and it's not such a big war, hard work, but we had to do very hard work in the past for people to understand the importance. So this is the key, how we can have awareness of the importance and knowing that we have to have a balance because the same argument is for coaching. People saying, I don't have time, I have to perform. I don't have time to develop my people. I don't have time for coaching. I don't have time for thinking about the future. Okay, what is the cost? So this is the question that we can ask as coaches to our clients. What is the cost of not investing in development? What is the cost of not investing in the future? And yes, we need to perform, we need to produce results. But if you think today what makes you successful today will not make you successful in the future. So if you don't look at that, yes, you get the result today, but who knows tomorrow? Mm. It, it goes back to, and I think it amplifies the second big question that I asked, what are you optimizing for? And so many people are optimizing for today. I want that promotion. I want the raise. I want to get a good re performance review. And the more you focus on that, the less you're investing in your future performance. So if you're optimizing for current performance, you are slowly becoming obsolete. If you invest too much in future performance, you will get fired. <laughs> you know, so you, you have to figure out what's the right balance. Yeah. And you know, it, it, there's a, a, a simple principle, 70, 20, 10. 70% 70 of your time, you, you know, as a starting point, you might invest in current performance. 
20%, you might invest in the next job that you want. Like, what am I doing to become a more strategic visionary leader? And then 10% of the time, you should be thinking about your 10-year plan. What are the skills I'll need in 10 years? And how will that shape like the next job that I want? I see so many people kind of getting promoted, getting promoted, getting promoted, and then waking up one day and saying, there's, there's nowhere for me to go now. I'm in the wrong job. I, 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 you know, I got stuck here at a small peak. Now I need to step back and you know, go to a new company or a new career or a new field. And if you had stopped to think about that five years ago, you might have made a little less money five years ago, but you'd be so much better positioned today for the future that you really want. So that what are you optimizing for today or tomorrow? Make your tomorrow easier. Make your tomorrow better. It's the first order and second order consequences. You can have an easy life today and a hard life tomorrow, or you can work to make your tomorrow better and easier. Yeah, it's always between the chocolate brownie and... Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the thing <laughs> is, is, as Damien said, companies don't care. They want your 100% performance today. The problem is they'll hire somebody else if you're not doing a good job tomorrow. So you have to make the tough choices yourself. That's the, the, the challenge in all of this. Yeah. No, uh, very, very powerful. And, and, and I'm picking up balance is a very important word in, in all of this, right? Just just figuring out what, what, what is that right balance is absolutely important. Uh, lots of questions coming in the q and I'm just going to try to pick a couple. Um, and so, um, yeah, this is one from um, Ashok Ayer. It says, is not seeing the corner arising out of preferring to be in a comfort zone? How does coaching draw out a client from this preferred zone and invest in foresight? I think you did answer it, but you want to add anything more? Um, you know, maybe maybe about the, not so much about the need to pull out from comfort zone, but, you know, as a coach, what is what are some of the things that happen to you or the process about this whole thing about pulling people out of their comfort zone? You want to start, Damien? Uh, yeah, I can br briefly, what I can say that, it's important to explore that and to explore what is underlying when the first, the level of readiness. And we have a competency model at ICF with a framework, but clients come to coaching in very different places. And not all clients are ready to go and follow all of these uh, standards. Uh, so we need to understand where people are coming from. And there is a, a distinction of the idea of coachability, how coachable they are. And that is also related to the ability to go and be uncomfortable and challenge ourselves. Um, so many people are, come to coaching in places where they are not very sophisticated in looking at themselves in the mirror, what can be painful or can be scary. Uh, so sometimes when I have clients and they are coming from that place that I see that they don't want to leave their comfort zone, I am very compassionate and I'm wondering what is going on. So I'm curious. You know, I use a lot the idea of the iceberg. In the iceberg, you see resistance to change or you see uh, I don't want to be uncomfortable. But then when you start exploring, you realize that they may fears. What are the fears that are there? Uh, some may be valid and some may be are imaginatory. So the ones that are not real are the ones that we can challenge as coaches. And, and one of the questions that I like to ask is, what is the worst that can happen? You know, if you go ahead and, and you do that, <laughs> you take the risk and you're uncomfortable, what is the worst that can happen? Um, well. I'll, I'll pick up with that. What's the worst that could happen? And people say, well, I might get fired. And then, and then what? <laughs> Well, I love like, that. I, I could probably find another job. And then what? Well, you know, I've been thinking about leaving and looking for a new job. Okay. So what's the worst that could happen? You know, the worst that could happen is I'll probably find a better job. Wait. <laughs> exactly. you know, so you, it, it, as you start to explore that. But at the heart of this issue, it's something that Damien said earlier. You have to get comfortable with discomfort. 
And so in a world that's changing and stretching us and ambiguous and disruptive, all of those things are uncomfortable. But if we know that's the future, we have to get better at leaning into that future, leaning into the discomfort. And so one of the ways to build this capability is to do at least one thing every day at the edge of your comfort zone. And same thing with my clients. I say, what are you going to do tomorrow that's at the edge of your comfort zone? There's no learning in the comfort zone. The learning is always at the edge of the comfort zone. So there's no learning in the comfort zone and there's no comfort in the learning zone. And when you start to internalize that, you, you can begin, okay, now I'm going to push myself a little harder. It's like going back to exercise. You get fit by running or pushing yourself, doing push-ups until you get to the edge of your comfort zone. It's not comfortable, but that's the only way you get better. And so do you want to be better or do you want to be comfortable? And comfortable only lasts for a little while. I was thinking, David, I was thinking about the same example. And, and I have my own personal experience. So I have a coach, a trainer at the gym. And, and sometimes I tell him, oh, I am not being a good client today. <laughs> I can't go. <laughs> he is, you know, pushing me to do things and I don't want to do it. And he says, oh, I am not being a good client today. I don't want to do that. Uh, he said, come on, you need to do more. You know, like, uh, and then I say, okay, I'm going to be a good client. And I do things that I may not want to do. But uh, I know that it's good for me at the end because I trust him because I know he had my best interest in mind. Um, but sometimes I can be on the other side too. I can be in their shoes and I, I can play with him and I am aware of that and I, I make a joke or, uh, and then I do it anyways. But sometimes I complain a little bit <laughs> because it's human, you know, it's, it let, let me completely honest here. And we've all been there, but that's where I think it helps to come back to what's your goal. You know, do you want to be comfortable or do you want to be fitter? Oh, I want to be fitter. <laughs> I, want to, I want to lose weight. I want to, you know, okay, then two more push ups. I, I can relate to the push ups. I, I relate I, I, to I'm, that. I'm still there. So, you know, I related to that sometimes. I don't like him. And I remember when I tell my clients, sometimes you would not like me. So, I wanted to tell you this is in contracting when we start the relationship. I contract for that. If I am going to be challenging them, there may be one day that they will not like me because I may go to that uncomfortable place. Yeah. Um, I mean, you you folks make it just seem so easy. I'm sure it takes years of, um, you know, beautiful reflective work to get there. But I think we, we should all think about being um, uncomfortable with that discomfort itself, right, in the, in the relationship. As long as... Maybe we should also ask ourselves as coaches, what's our goal, really, right? In my role as a coach, what's my goal? And I think that can give us clarity. Um, I think we just have time for one more question. And I'm going to pick this one because, uh, Demian, I don't know whether you know, uh, Meryl is in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a question that's come up, which is about uh, a growth mindset is essential abnormal for a system, which in its nature seeks homeostasis. So... How to increase people's capacity for risk taking? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> to think. I, I always love that question. So I, I mentioned this earlier. Work at the edge of your comfort zone. It's like a muscle. And I I'll, I'll give an example. It's not about learning, but it's about the finding where the edge is. So when people watch me coaching, they might say, oh, you pushed really hard and you, you're not touchy feely with people. And then they watch me coach someone who's very um, vulnerable. David, you're so supportive. And it's because I'm working at the edge of that comfort zone. Here's someone who like is timid and afraid and scared of being hurt. And so it's like, oh, good job. Keep it going. Like, just, just instead of like, give me 10 more push-ups. it's like, just lay down on the floor to start with, you know, that, okay, I, I can do that. I can't do any push-ups, but okay, I can go lay down on the floor. All right. Whereas somebody else who's already doing a hundred push-ups when they come in, it's like, 
don't even talk to me until you've done 200. You know, so it's it's tougher, it's harder, but I'm, I'm adjusting to find the edge of their comfort zone and that's where the growth happens. So it's very different for each person, but you, you find out where that comfort zone is and just kind of provide what it takes to help them go one step farther. And, and to complement that, I think that talking about our homeostasis in organizations, you may be working with a client or with a leader, but then the rest of the organization may not go in the same direction than you're working with your client. So that can be challenging. So that's the reason why I like to think systemically. So I like to engage the, all the stakeholders who are appropriate. For example, if I'm working with a leader, the boss of the leader, HR, um, anybody who may support whatever work we are doing. Like, like today, for example, I had a, an interview for one organization to provide team uh, coaching and they wanted me to work with the team. And I said, okay, what happened with the senior leader team? Because I can work with them, but if the senior leader are going to be going in a different direction, it's not going to be a good investment for this organization, for me just to work with this team. And they were finding excuses not to engage the senior leaders in the process. So I said, you know, I want you to think about it because I don't want you to waste your money and time. If we don't start from the top of the organization and the, organiz and the leaders are not aligned, the work that I may do with the team will be very limited. So I think that these are the kind of things that we can do to avoid this uh, hemostasis. It's uh, thinking systemically, engage all stakeholders. And uh, yeah, there are going to be always forces against the future thinking, innovation. There are going to be people who are going to be afraid. So it's also planning. It's like in coaching, when we talk about obstacles at the end of the conversation, what may be in your way? Well, we leaders is the same thing. What may be in your way when you want to be innovative, creative, and you're going to be doing these things, and what are you going to be finding against you? So by thinking in advance, you will be better prepared to embrace it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we could go on in this conversation for a couple of hours, uh, but you know, I've got a job to do. And uh, with, a, with a very heavy heart, <laughs> I want to bring this to a close, but not without um, inviting each of you to share what's coming up for you in the moment. Just one message you want to leave, because I know there are leaders here in the room. I know there are people who are just curious about coaching and there are very seasoned coaches as well. If there's one thing you just want to leave us with. And, um, you know, more so also in the context of this conclave, which is all what you all spoke about, right? So in, in, in its embodiment, we want it to be systemic. We want it to address larger questions um, and, and we want it to be really at that edge of everyone's comfort zone. So closing remarks. For me, it's simply recognizing that it doesn't get easier. And so going back to the quote at the end of my slide presentation, a year from now, you may wish, uh, and I would say, you will wish you had started today. And it's that notion of what will you do to get started today? What's one simple thing you can do at the edge of your comfort zone to get started today? That is the question for you to ponder through the rest of your day today. And to accompany, to go together with that question, I am so going to go back to my last quote from my session. <laughs> we went to the same place, David, and wonder why. Uh, know yourself, know your limits, and don't respect them. So keep working on yourself, keep working on knowing what are your strengths and weaknesses. And by the way, we are not human beings, we're human becomings because we are changing all the time. So as when we think we know each other, we're a different person. So this is an ongoing discovery for the rest of our life, who we are, what are strengths and areas for development right now, and challenge yourself, move forward, treat yourself. Yeah. Oh, I so love this. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. This was amazing. And I am all charged to do something today in this conclave. And we're going to all rock this. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, participants. I mean, I'm loving all the emojis coming in. Keep them going. And uh, David, Damien, 
heartful thanks to both of you. I know it's late in the night for you all, but I think after this session, you can also sleep really well, knowing the difference that you've made to so many of us here today. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much.